As you know, on Wednesday, the ha my House Democratic colleagues extended the honor to me to continue to serve as House Democratic leader, for which I am honored and delighted and humble and grateful. Our caucus has been energized by members who have been stepped forward wanting to get to work, and I'm pleased that our caucus is building consensus and creating new roles in the leadership on committees and at the DCCC. That's why I'm a little bit late, because we were finishing uh, some of that uh, in there. That interest in working and participating is uh, music to my ears. There's hard work ahead, but with the strength, wisdom, and resourcefulness within our caucus, I know House Democrats uh, will meet the challenges ahead. Uh, that's why Democrats are eager to work with Republicans to swiftly pass a bold infrastructure bill to rebuild America and create good-paying jobs. However, congressional Republicans are eager, clearly more interested in dismantling Medicare uh, than building job-creating infrastructure, with Chairman Price headed to the HHS. Speaker Ryan moves closer to realizing his dream and America's nightmare of shattering the Medicare guarantee and protecting generations of American seniors. Democrats will fight them with all of our strength, just as we did in 2005 and 2006 when President Bush tried to privatize Social Security. Now Republicans are even threatening to gut and privatize the VA, a deeply radical and destructive move that could hurt <coughs> veterans across America. Uh, we've heard from the veterans. Paul Reichoff, executive director, Iraq Afghan Veterans of America, said, the worst-case scenario within the vets community is a total dismantling of everything they worked generations to create. There's a growing fear that it's all going to get burned down. Verna Jones, executive director of the American Legion, said, veterans deserve to go to the VA. We oppose privatization. Veteran service organizations have already communicated their eagerness to work with both sides of the aisle to prevent this disastrous privatization scheme. Uh, we are, um, again, very pleased with the work that was done with the uh, Cures Act. That was the place where we worked together, had a big, strong vote uh, that uh, made resources available for precision medicine, brain research, and with great pride, Vice President Biden's moonshot, uh, cancer moonshot. Long overdue, $1 billion in opioid treatment funds. We've been calling for that funding for a while. We've gotten bills, but we haven't gotten money. Uh, improvements in mental health and substance use disorder services. We hope that by this Republican Congress will meet its responsibility to robustly fund these commitments in years ahead. Because the way the bill is written, it's for this coming year with a commitment for what comes next, but we want that commitment to be a guarantee. With that, I'd be pleased to take any questions you have. Yes, sir. Um, Republicans are moving ahead with uh, plans to repeal parts of Obamacare. Yeah. They mentioned that they want to replace those through regular channels, which would likely require some Democratic support. <coughs> are you ready at this point to work with Republicans on crafting and what that would look like? Well, I do think if the Republicans have some suggestions, uh, we would be open to having some co uh, conversations about how we can approve the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it is important to note, though, that you can't say, I'm going to have uh, no pre-existing condition discrimination, or we're, gonna not, we're still going to have no lifetime limits in the rest, but undermine the rest of the bill. So what is, the, uh, you know, what is their agenda? Uh, a mandate is a Republican idea. Uh, we're always ready to listen, as I would have been if Democrats had been uh, in power to say, what improvements can we make? But we're not going to be party to the decision. ...medical conditions which have barred them uh, from uh, care and insurance. It's also important to uh, anyone who has a lifetime limit. So if you have a precondition, you will fall into that category too. If your a baby is born with a, uh, a condition that lifetime limits on that the care of that child uh, would be a disaster. So it's important to note that you can't keep the good things without keeping the big 
pool of people who uh, contribute to it uh, and make the whole country healthier. It's about the health of America as much as it is about the health care or the health insurance of America. Uh, so, you know, again, you're always listening, but it's not in it to dismantle. If it's an existential threat uh, to the access to care in our country, that would be a problem. If there are things we can do working together, of course. And would that mean working on them with something that doesn't flow? in our country or we were just forming a new country you probably end up you probably had single payer and you certainly would have public option uh, and I still think that that would be a good place to go the public option but um, that's not what it is you, you, you have to you have a seven it's important to note this 75 percent of people in our country have their health care through their employer of the remaining 25 percent uh, 20 million of them are in the Affordable Care Act other people are, are on Medicare, Medicaid, I mean, Medicaid and the rest. Um, but uh, since there is an expansion of Medicaid, not everyone eligible for uh, Medicaid within the Affordable Care Act has access that they should have. So anyway, let's take it this way. 75% are under, under uh, employer-based care uh, insurance. Of those people, they all benefit from no pre-existing conditions, no lifetime limits. Your child can stay on your policy until you're 26 year old. Six year old, no longer being a woman is a pre-existing medical condition. So understand that this is not just about the 20 million. It's about the vast majority of our country benefiting from that. And uh, so, the whatever it is we do impacts all of those people in addition to the 20 million. But if they're going to come forward with something that says we're turning away these 20 million, I think that's going to be a big fight in our country. Many more people are benefiting from it than who might say they support it right now. But when you ask them, do you want it to be repealed, it's like 20%. 20%. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Ma'am. Well, they keep the calendar, but I don't know if the work, the work will be finished. Uh, the, uh, I, I just uh, had a brief conversation with the When is that going to be ready? Supposedly by, supposedly by Monday. Uh, then it takes a few days to get on the calendar and it goes to the Senate. And uh, are they in agreement as to what that, uh, how that will work? And so that, I think, is more dispositive of when we leave uh, than the, uh, the issue that you bring up. And, and it could be, um, we could end, the, end of next week, but I think we're on alert that it could go another, another week. Yes. And, and, uh, uh, The word of bill, we're all, almost all in agreement. Our disagreement is that they want to, the Republicans want to drop the Buy America provision from the word of bill. That would be problematic for us. Uh, of course, they have the vote, so they can go forward if they wish. But we have a very big concern about that. And uh, that's part of what was holding up. We were supposed to have it resolved probably by about n now. And I don't know if that's happened since I've come in the room. are because it's not it's one thing to have an authorization it's another thing to have the money and that's where we are interested in the juxtaposition between the word of bill and the uh, continuing resolution uh, but um, I'm very hopeful that we can have a word of bill because it would be very important for our country we need the 
one way. Consented Senate about how things are paid for and the rest. So that's what that is. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You guys are heading into next Congress with the same top three leaders. New funds likely to be realized. Yes. So I know that you've added some lower level leadership positions, but what, if anything, has changed fundamentally in the caucus, and what do you take away from the last three years? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, we just had a very, very positive uh, meeting with the um, with our caucus. Uh, we had a rapprochement, a, a wonderful uh, coming up to terms between Ben Ray Lujan and Sean Patrick Maloney, the two of them very open to each other's ideas. They created uh, how, how we can work together in a stronger way. And it was, it was a lovely sight. In fact, they wanted to just move for the election right now. And I said, no, we said Monday, so we'll wait until Monday. These are not lower level positions. Everybody's in that room. Uh, they're an equal voice. I'm very excited about the fact that we will elect the three members of the policy committee. Uh, somebody said, we're doing what Chuck did. No, Chuck did what we did last time. Last time we created the, the uh, Steve Israel position. Now we're expanding it to three. Uh, there are more members who will be elected, a freshman uh, to the leadership and a um, uh, person fewer than five terms. I mean, these are substantial <coughs> places. It took me um, oh, 15 years, probably, to get to the leadership table. These people get there in freshman year or a uh, um, couple, couple of terms. So it's, uh, I'm, a, I'm practically liberated by it because more people want to take responsibility. And in no way would they consider this lower level, especially from their perspective in the Congress. It's a big honor. Um, uh, their invigoration is important to it all. And uh, it, it, as we go forward, as we and, and we will be unwavering in our support of America's working families. That is what joins us together. Everything else is um, part of who we are, but what unifies. But wait a minute, you want to say that seven senators are asking for the declassification of it, and you want me to tell you what is the new uh, co chair of the steering politics? Policy Committee, Eric Swalwell, a new member of Congress, the head of the uh, uh, Future Forum, travel the country listening to uh, people, young millennials across the country, is also a member of the Intelligence Committee. And he is working with uh, Elijah Cummings, a, you know, our champion on, in uh, uh, finding out the truth of what's going on and some of this. Uh, they are th talking about calling for an I'll let them make their own announcement, but to take us to a investigation, even if Hillary Clinton had won. It isn't about who wins or not. It's about what the interference is. I've said this to you before. Uh, we witnessed it. I knew, I said, in, at the uh, com uh, convention in July, I know that it's the Russians. I know because I paid for the investigation of our own hacking. I know it's the Russians. I don't know that from any classified information. I know it from our own investigation. A couple, two, three months later, uh, the highest level of, of, of confidence from our uh, intelligence communities said the Russians hacked our, our committees. Every day, emails came out from the Democratic side 
I frankly think there could have been more aggressive uh, coverage of, of the fact that a foreign government was hacking our, our uh, committees, but it just was like something that was going on, and, and, uh, and, but the fact is something awful was going on. What was interesting to me is that the, the director of the FBI did not, he, he did not want to sign that consensus report because it was too close to the election and he didn't want to affect the election, but he had no trepidation or hesitation or qualm about putting forth a letter that said might be, a, might be insignificant 12 days before the election, which uh, uh, others revealed was coming a couple of days before. So that's why our distinguished chairman, uh, real champion ranking member, uh, Elijah Cummings, has been in the lead asking for an inspector general report about that particular All well are going to be working for uh, some call for us to investigate or whatever. I'll let them make their own announcement and because they're shaping it, and, and I wouldn't even be able to tell you what it is because they're doing it, uh, to, um, uh, to uncover what is happening. It's, it's about our democracy. Part of the Russian agenda is to undermine democracy, not just in our country, but in other countries as well, uh, to, to hack, to to uh, alter and to um, uh, disclose, and it's just not, it's just not right. And I think that, that uh, it was shameful that this was able to go on. So evidently, uh, a foreign government uh, undermining our democracy without more being said about it at the time. The, uh, so that, that will happen, yeah. But I can't. Well, the, the, the declassification is really up to the president, and uh, probably, I mean, it, and just so you know this, the president can declassify something by just saying it. It has all the power in the world. It's, very, it's, a, it's a mighty power, actually. Whatever the, if, if the president said something that was highly classified information, say by mistake or something, he would not be vulnerable because his very saying it declassifies it. So uh, I, 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 I haven't seen the letter. I think there should be more information known to the American people, whether that's by declassification, uh, whatever. Maybe that's the investigation that Mr. Swalwell and Mr. Cummings want to have. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.